want of considering the question of what makes us more effective in team and organizational settings is understanding how we become more adaptable across a lot of different situations. To understand that, we have to answer first the question, what influences the type of experiences we have in our organizations? So let's take a look at this graphic. If we put ourselves at the center, we find that we have to understand our own personal needs, dispositions, competencies, expectations, and skills. All of those directly influence and are influenced by our interpersonal experiences and our small group experiences. This is both the baggage that we bring with us to any new situation and is influenced by our experience within an organization. So at the interpersonal level, the experiences we have with our peers, our supervisors, access to information, the organization's culture, and the politics of the environment shape our experience, but so too does our experience with a range of groups, including the group work directly, but also the social support we receive, roles we're expected to take on, the norms and the opportunities for innovation, and of course, yes, the politics of those situations. In turn, both of these, the interpersonal and the small group experiences, are influenced by organizations. So its goals, its culture, its policies, and its reward systems, as well as the outcomes of being in an organization that can include things like how much we identify personally with the organization, or the quality of our job performance, or how satisfied we are with the communication environment within the organization, and of course, how satisfied we are with the job. All of these kinds of things interact. And all of these factors influences our experience and we have influence over these as well to different degrees. But what explains the motivation for all of us to go to work each day? This helps us to better understand how adaptable we can be. And so there are four competing theories that I wanna to introduce to see which one resonates with us in particular. One way of explaining our adaptability of different situations or our motivation to stay in different situations is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. At the ba very basic level, the theory argues, we are most interested in making sure that we have our basic needs met. So food, housing, and it includes things like then safety and security. So it argues that people will stay in undesirable job situations because these basic needs drive us the most. But once we are secure, then we look at social belonging kinds of issues, how well we like the environment, and certainly how well we like the people within them. And once we feel like we're connected and we belong, then we pursue other interests, like our ability to be promoted, have respect or esteem positions, and fully de develop our professional potential come into play. But as soon as a more base need is threatened, then those others tend to lose priority. So what keeps us motivated will likely depend, according to Maslow's hierarchy, on where we're at in terms of each of our needs being secure and stable. So if we think of Maslow's hierarchy in combination with all the factors that influence our, our experience, it argues we can begin to understand a lot of the tensions in work environments and why people often stay in frustrating circumstances. But this, in a lot of ways, is a fairly negative theory. It shows why we would remain in undesirable situations. It doesn't help to show oftentimes what makes us adaptable to new situations and to new environments that we want to work in. A different way maybe to think about worker motivation and what keeps us interested and agile in our work environment is to think about motivation hygiene theory. Now, we know that millennials and Gen Z folks want to feel good about the organizations that they work in, that it's not enough to have the basics and the personal motivations taken care of. So there's something more to it. Motivation hygiene theory might offer a better explanation for some. The easiest way to get your mind around this theory is to think about what it means for us to take a good shower or use deodorant. Well, why do we do it? To, to be more socially acceptable so that we don't smell bad. But the question is, does being presentable make us a good person? Of course it doesn't. So motivation hygiene theory looks at what motivates people to perform well versus what really 
enhances our experience and the quality of our experience in being in an organization. So it moves beyond a hierarchy of needs and says there's basics and then there's what enhances the experience, what makes us more adaptable. So in many organizational settings, we're compelled to perform well as employees because of hygiene factors. We want to look for our supervisors. We're paid. We have very specific job specifications or expectations. So if we do that, then we're doing the minimum that we need to stay in the organization. Does this motivate us? It might, but not may not be enough. So it's like having a shower so that we don't stink. But it, that's not necessarily what makes us a great employee. And it's certainly not what makes us more adaptable to different experiences. So the theory argues that what makes our work life better and ultimately improves our performance is not only that we can meet the expectations and work with our supervisors, but that we also feel a sense of achievement, contentment, and responsibility in our work. So motivation hygiene theory says that when these are in balance, workers are typically more satisfied and less likely to look for, good, for new jobs. That this is what keeps us motivated, this is what keeps us adapting to new situations, new tools, technologies, or even crises. A third explanation for worker motivation is much simpler. Skinner's positive reinforcement theory says that workers are motivated to be agile, to be adaptive, and to remain by positive reinforcement. So much like teaching our pets to sit up because they'll get a treat, if workers are treated well, they're offered incentives, they'll be motivated to do everything that they have to do and to innovate for the organization, just hopefully with a little less drool. It's a very old theory, and don't be too dismissive of it because it's still a basis for a lot of management assumptions about workers and what we're looking for. For example, a lot of modern companies that people are clamoring to work for, like Google, will pitch themselves to new employees by talking about free meals, open kitchens, energy drinks, gym memberships, movie nights, work socials, and even different kinds of bonuses based on performance, based on innovation. And these companies all have a lot of applicants. So this is going to clearly motivate some people. So if we think about what motivates, what keeps us moving ahead, is it gain? Is it being offered some kind of incentive? Skinner's positive reinforcement theory offers another explanation for what it could be. A final way to understand worker motivation and adaptability is through social information processing theory. Think of it like a simple recipe. We start with our own perception of our jobs. We add the experience that we've had with our teams and our organization. And we add our view of past behaviors. And this all comes out as our needs and our attitudes within the work environment. This influences our behavior according to the theory. And it in influences how we view the overall environment that we work in. So we develop the skills that we think we're going to need to help us get along better, either at a technical skill or a relational skill level. We take feedback and based on our own attitudes and we go with it. This is something that we take within the organizations we're in and to new organizations when we join. But no matter what influences our experiences, when we think about the role that we play within our organizational environments, it means that we have the opportunity to take stock of our own traits, competencies, skills and motivations, and then try and figure out what works for us, what will help us, and often what we need to do to improve on for ourselves and our teams. So if you're trying to answer the question, what makes for a good employee and what makes for a good organization, all of these factors, including these four different theories for explaining worker motivation, can help us to better understand the answer to that question and what we'll find is that there are a lot of correct answers to that question. So it's a critical reflectiveness that I think it's good to develop throughout our careers.